what do you know about education? They'll tell you it's about getting a job, becoming a well-educated member of society, lifting your family out of poverty. But you want to know what it's really about? What do you see? A kid from Louisiana going to university? I see $104,000 in college tuition after scholarship aid, $47,000 in on-campus accommodations, $7,000 in books, textbooks, and college supplies. I see a total of $159,340 in revenue over the next four years of this poor sucker's life. That is what it costs for one American to get through a respectable college. But that's not all. See, this kid's parents can't afford $160,000, so they're going to take out a student loan. And before COVID, that student loan will return 5% every year over 10 years, which comes up to an additional $43,000 in pure interest from just one customer. That means the lifetime value of a student can be as high as $200,000 or more. Over 44 million Americans owe $1.6 trillion in student debts. You heard me right, $1.6 trillion. That is the size of Canada's entire economy. And that is what higher education is really about. Education isn't about getting you ready for life, it's about money. You smell that? Opportunity. No, money. I smell money. Anyone who disagrees with it is either in it or stupid. But it wasn't always this way. See, before student loans, universities used to be somewhat affordable and reasonable. But today, it's morphed into a very profitable industry for those at the top, where naive kids are shoved in and out comes obedient debt slaves. This is the education industrial complex. Thankfully, college isn't the only way to make money anymore. More and more people are realizing that the only thing you need to make money is an internet connection and a desire to learn new skills. That is where Brilliant comes in. Brilliant is a website and app that provides you with fun interactive courses in science, technology, and math. Computer science? The average computer scientist makes $106,000 a year, and Brilliant has a learning path that gives you a solid foundation in the subjects. Quantum computing engineers? They make $135,000 a year on average. Brilliant has an exciting course for that too. There's one on data science, another one on probability, statistics, and finance, and much more. And what makes Brilliant different from everything else is that it focuses on learning by doing instead of hours of boring lectures or textbook exercises. With Brilliant, you get to jump right into solving problems and exercising your knowledge while being coached little by little until you find that you've learned a fundamental concept in STEM. Plus, you get instant feedback along the way so you can improve as fast as possible. There are no tests or exams, just choose what you're into and get started. And to get you started, Brilliant is giving you 20% off when you go to brilliant.org slash jaketran with the link below. That's brilliant.org slash jaketran to sign up for free and get 20% off. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. October 4th, 1957. The day Russia revealed it had built a rocket so powerful that it launched the first man-made satellite into space, Sputnik 1. If the Soviets could send a satellite into space, there was little doubt they could send a nuclear bomb to the US. So the race was on. Now here is a photograph released by the Soviets of the satellite, and this is a track of what you will see in the lower half of your television screen. So be sure that you watch very, very carefully. And at the helm of this competition to outsmart and outperform the Soviets was Senate Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson. According to Johnson, the Soviets had won this battle due to higher education. If America was planning on winning the war, it would need a lot more college grads. The problem was, even though tuition back then was pennies on the dollar compared to today, it still wasn't cheap per se, and student loan programs were extremely selective. Johnson wanted to change that, so he went to Congress. He explained how college grads earn an average of $100,000 more over 30 years compared to non-grads. Therefore, they could easily pay back a student loan if we gave one to them. And this was in the name of defeating the evil Soviets. How could you not support something like this? The government liked what he was selling. So in September 1957, President Eisenhower signed the cleverly named National Defense Education Act, which created the National Defense Student Loan Program. This basically combined two of America's favorite buzzwords, national security and education. National security. Education. National security. Education. National security. Education. There was no way this was not going to pass. So just 11 months after Sputnik's launch, the U.S. government entered the student loan business. The National Defense Student Loan Program started by offering schools money to give eligible students a loan up to $1,000 a year, enough to cover tuition. To give you some perspective, the average income back then was around $5,000 a family. Congress had only approved a specific amount of these loans, and pretty soon the money ran out. 
but by then thousands of students had gone to colleges thanks to these loans. So the higher ups of higher education had gotten a whiff of what was possible. If they played their cards right, the US government could bankroll their entire business. So they pushed for the program to expand, and it did. Over and over, the loan program ran out of money. And over and over again, Congress would vote to give it more money. People were paying off their loans, they were becoming more educated, and the US was on track to leave the Soviets in the dust. It was working. Then Lyndon B. Johnson became president, and life got even better. He was a true believer in the American dream, and he wanted everyone to have a shot at achieving it. By the mid-1960s, the government was paying out so much money to fund student loans, the federal spending limit topped $100 billion for the first time ever. President Johnson wanted to keep expanding the student loan program even more, but suddenly Congress got nervous. All of this money was flowing out, but it took at least four years to see any sort of repayments. And when the repayment started, it was an increment spread out over many years. So he found an alternative. He turned to the banks for help. And by doing that, he created one of the worst debt traps the world has ever seen, the modern student loan system. In 1965, Congress passed the Higher Education Act. It was the basis for the system we have today, where poorer students are offered scholarships or grants, and middle class students get guaranteed loans. To do this, they created a guarantee agency that would make sure the banks kept giving out loans. As usual, banks and lenders would give out student loans, then the government would give the guarantee agency 80% of the money the student borrowed. That way, if the student defaulted, the guarantee agency would fully reimburse the bank for the money they lost, plus the interest they would have made. The standard rate to repay a student loan was set at 6%, so while the students were studying and not making money, the government would pay the rate to the banks. Nine months after graduation, that responsibility would fall onto the students. In Johnson's eyes, it was the perfect system. College grads would get great degrees, land high paying jobs and repay that debt easily, allowing even more students to take out loans. At least that was the plan. See, this created a very lucrative feedback loop for schools. Suddenly, thousands of people who would have never been able to study suddenly wanted to go to college. In other words, demand skyrocketed while supply remained the same. To address this extra demand, colleges simply raised their tuition rates. You see, colleges had the leverage now. The government had overplayed its hand. It has shown how badly it wanted America to be the most educated nation on earth. So colleges knew no matter how high they wanted to raise their prices, the government would always be there to subsidize the money. The government didn't care how much it cost because it wasn't their money. Students and parents didn't care because they were getting a loan anyways. And that's exactly what colleges started to do. In the 60s, colleges raised tuition 30% above inflation, and this negative feedback loop only got worse. Colleges expanded, they grew into massive institutions with multiple campuses and hundreds of well-paid professors, all thanks to the freedom to charge as much tuition as they liked. Sally May was created to serve an urgent need. Banks didn't have any more money to offer students, and the government didn't want to lose its education momentum. It needed a new way to fund loans, so in 1972, Sally May was pitched as the solution. Banks would loan to students, and then Sally May would buy those loans from the banks, allowing them to continue lending. Sally May would then make back all the money the students repaid, plus a neat little profit off the top. In 1969, tuition at a private college was around $1,500 a year. Ten years later, it had more than doubled. By 1975, so many people had gone to college and were competing for the same jobs that thousands of students defaulted on their loans. They couldn't find jobs that paid enough to repay their loans. To make matters worse, the Clinton administration offered student loans directly from the federal governments. They were cheaper than anything banks could offer, and for a while, it looked like the end of Sally Mae. But in 1994, Republicans took power and moved to privatize Sally Mae, i.e. they turned Sally Mae into a private company. Now Sally Mae didn't have to rely on the government's approval for anything. Instead, they could borrow from investors and offer much larger student loans at much higher interest rates, creating an incredibly profitable business. All this convoluted stuff meant that for colleges, the mix of private and government student loans meant that the sky was the limit. They could raise their prices as much as they wanted. Universities have stumbled upon a universal truth. If you want to charge more money, either create a monopoly or get the government to subsidize it. The student loan trap as we know it had merged into its final form. On making sure that public schools all across America fulfill the promise, make sure every child is educated and not one single child gets left behind in America. By the 2000s, a year's tuition was sending around $20,000, a 13x increase, and the competition between Sally Mae and federal student loans was tougher than ever. Sally Mae would pay college loan officers to recommend Sally Mae as the best loan provider. 
They would place Sally Mae employees at college call centers, tricking students into thinking that they were talking to a student counselor, and that Sally Mae was really the best option for them. They sponsored cruises and luxury trips for college financial advisors, and the federal government just couldn't keep up. And when George Bush took office in 2001, he made Sally Mae's life even easier by cutting back government student loans even more. I graduated with degrees in aerospace engineering uh, in uh, 1999. Uh, I borrowed about $45,000 for school. Since that time, uh, my student loan debt has exploded. Uh, to where currently I owe about $103,000. By 2007, the federal loan program had lost 40% of a share of the student loan markets. When no one's standing in its way, Sally Mae called on every lobbyist, propagandist, and political influence it could find to sell the American dream. To sell the idea that success starts with a college degree. And Sally Mae found an unlikely ally, Barack Obama. And a four-year degree earns you a million dollars more than if you just had a high school degree. Think about that. I mean, a million dollars, that's, that's real money. When Obama became president in 2009, his solution to the financial crisis was in part to make America's workforce the most educated in the world, playing directly into the hands of companies like Sally Mae. He asked every American to attend college, even for just a year. And a year was all Sally Mae would need to enslave his students. What Obama had hoped would alleviate the US economy actually tightened the grip around people's throats. Sure, he tried making life easier with things like capping student loan payments at 15% of the borrower's income, but that just made it an even easier sell for students to get in debt and for colleges to raise prices. The longer it took for students to pay off their loans, the more money Sally Mae made in interest. Obama played right into the hands of the lenders. By 2012, student debt hit $1 trillion. For universities, it was no longer a game of who can provide the best education. It was now a game of who can offer the most education, air quotes. Who has the biggest campus? Who has the most useless degrees to choose from? Who has the best sports teams? Who has the best extracurricular activities? Who has the best amenities? Many compete by advertising luxury. They promote things like lobster dinners. Students will come to us and say, this is what sealed the deal. It used to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. And well, we're now the fourth R, recreation. This is a public school. Taxpayers fund that spring break. We also fund years of study in subjects unlikely to help students get jobs, like social justice, gender studies, multicultural studies. What's powerful is that for most sketchy businesses, it's pretty well known that it's sketchy. Think Nestle, Monsanto, Wall Street, but higher education? They have the entire American culture cheering them on. They even have your own parents cheering them on. What started out as a campaign to make higher education more accessible has led to a psychotic 3,000% increase in costs and a generation of debt slaves. This is the education industrial complex, where the ones that benefit the most are the universities, politicians, and bankers. Almost half the students who get loans don't graduate in six years. Many won't ever pay off their loans. Today, American students carry about one and a half trillion dollars in federal student loan debt. So taxpayers lose, students lose. I owe $108,137. The winners are rich colleges, 